prayer, excuse me, the chair is authorized to declare recesses of the subcommittee at any time. We need prayers, don't we? Welcome to today's hearing titled Regulating Space, Innovation, Liberty, and International Obligations. And I recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. The Outer Space Treaty celebrated its 50th anniversary just last month. It was negotiated at the height of the Cold War and reflected two very distinct philosophies, communism and liberty. The Soviet Union sought to prevent any non-state actors from operating in space. The United States, however, argued that space should be free for exploration and use for all and by all, including the private sector and individuals. Fortunately, the United States' position was the one accepted. As part of that compromise, the United States agreed in Article VI of the treaty to authorize and supervise private sector space activities. When the Senate ratified the Outer Space Treaty 50 years ago, private free enterprise in outer space was just an idea, but not yet a reality. <clears throat> Today, not only is there U.S. free enterprise in outer space, it is innovating at an unprecedented pace. American companies are developing and investing in technology and spacecraft to conduct non-traditional private sector space activities, such as satellite servicing, manufacturing, human habitation, and space resource utilization. Recognizing that American free enterprise and innovation in outer space may implicate our international obligations, Congress directed the Obama administration to assess existing authorization and supervision authorities. Last year, the Obama administration recommended that Congress expand the regulatory authority of the Secretary of Transportation. Well, the purpose of today's hearing is to inform Congress as it assesses U.S. international obligations in light of new and innovative private space activities. I hope it will also inform the incoming Trump administration as it formulates its own positions on this topic. I look forward to working with the administration going forward and plan to invite them to testify in the future once they have developed a formal position. I hope that today's witnesses will uh, identify fundamental national interests at stake examine our international obligation to authorize and supervise space activities, expand on the options that we have at our disposal to meet, these, to meet authorization and supervise obligations, and help us all assess and understand different paths forward. The course we chart today may not seem very important, but in the long run, the decisions that we make will have far-reaching consequences. I recognize that today there is no consensus opinion on what should be done. I also recognize that there are many different ideas. Frankly, this is a good thing. This is a serious issue and we should do our best to get it right. And that entails examining all the possible solutions. I have serious reservations with the Section 108 legislative proposal. While it may be well-intentioned, it is ill-conceived. It places the burden of demonstrating consistency with international obligations, foreign policy, and national security requirements of the United States with the applicant, leaving the government to decide at its own discretion, without clear limitations, whether an activity should go forward. <clears throat> it grants expansive discretionary regulatory authority, essentially with the ability to regulate any or all aspects of the private sector space activities. It also fails to identify or assess alternatives to a Department of Transportation Agency licensing and regulatory construct. We must not just presume that a traditional agency licensing authority granted to the Department of Transportation is the best way forward. This hearing will be an important step as the committee develops legislation that will streamline the regulatory process, limit burdensome government intrusion, promote American innovation and investment, and satisfy our international obligations. We must find a way to uphold our cherished principles of liberty and, the pri and prime the pump of innovation. I believe that we can do this while also satisfying 
our international obligations. If done correctly, we can expand American prosperity and influence. If done haphazardly, we could smother the embers of creativity and diminish our leadership in space. I believe it is one of the fundamental space policy questions of our time. I want to thank today's witnesses for joining us as we discuss these very important issues, and I look forward to hearing your testimony. And now at this time, I would like to introduce into the record uh, some letters that I have, and I will do so. Uh, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record letters of the Heritage Foundation, the Competitive Enterprise Institute, and Tech Freedom, and a paper published by the Niskanen Center. Uh, these letters and the paper were shared with minority staff in advance of the hearing, and without objection, I so order. I now recognize the ranking member, uh, the gentleman from California, for an opening statement. Mr. Barrow. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, good morning, and welcome to the distinguished panel. And again, I, I want to thank the chairman for um, you know, calling this hearing. I mean, I, this is a, a very timely topic. And in fact, you know, as the subcommittee embarks on the 115th Congress, you know, I think this is going to be a, a very vibrant time in how Congress, how our federal government, and, and NASA approach space. So. You know, I look forward to working with you and, and making this one of the, the most bipartisan, vibrant committee, subcommittees in, in Congress. I mean, think about where we were over 50 years, 50 years ago, in 1967. It was two years before Neil Armstrong was even going to land on the, the moon. Um, yet we were thinking about some of these issues. And when the United States signed the Outer Space Treaty in 1967, thankfully, as the chairman already pointed out, our approach to being open to the private sector getting involved in space was the one that, that, that won out. But we had no way of knowing where we, we, we would be in 2017. And if you think about how rapidly things have moved in the, the last decade with entrepreneurs, innovators um, moving into commercial space travel, you know, that, that's the, the challenge for us at, at this juncture is how do we move, move forward? You know, in, um, in 2015, we passed the Commercial Space Launch Competitive Competitiveness Act and it directed the, the Office of Science and Technology Policy um, to make some recommendations to Congress. And, and what they re recommended for us was an authorization supervision approach that would prioritize safety, utilize existing authorities, minimize burdens to commercial space transportation, um, promote the U.S. commercial space sector, and meet the U.S. obligations under international treaties. So there's a lot in there. Um, I think the challenge for this committee and um, all of us moving forward is as we look at the private sector getting more involved in low Earth orbit, as we look at more countries, you know, take India, for example, as they're rapidly um, getting involved, how do we put together a, a framework that does protect the assets that are up there, that in some ways acts as an air traffic control, managing the, the lanes that are there, minimizes the safety. We've got to work through liability issues and other issues. Um, but at the same time, we don't want to stifle that creativity and innovation. So you know, not easy issues to, to work through, but the issues that are incredibly important for us to, to work through in order to do our job so we can you know, give some clarity to those entrepreneurs and those that are, that are, that are entering the, the field, but understanding that we've got to have the right balance between the public sector. There are certain things that only NASA and the federal government can do, you know, much like our mission to Mars. Again, you'll hear me say we ought to set that goal and get there by 2033, but that's also going to be a public-private partnership where we're going to be working amongst others. I look forward to, to the testimony. In particular, I hope some of today's discussions can provide some clarity on the, the, the following questions. What is meant by continuing supervision as stated in Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty? Can our obligations under Art Article 6 be met by existing authorities? And if not, why not? And how would the U.S. government actually be able to enforce compliance when, once the mission is launched? Um, 
what are the potential risks of regulating or not regulating non-governmental missions that are not currently covered under existing government authorities? And is the U.S. government exposed to liabilities by granting mission authorization or approval? Again, I think those are some of the things that, that we need to, to, to work through. Again, you know, I look forward to a, a vibrant 115th Congress ser serving with the chairman and, and the broader committee. And again, I think this is a, a, a very timely topic for where we find ourselves. Thank you. I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Bear. I appreciate that. Uh, and now I recognize the chairman of our full committee, uh, the gentleman from Texas, uh, Chairman Smith. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. America's future in outer space is bright. From asteroid mining to private moon missions to satellite servicing, there is great promise that American commercial space companies will soon enjoy profits and discover scientific benefits to being in outer space. American visionaries stand ready to facilitate these amazing endeavors. Unfortunately, the Obama administration issued a report last year that called for expansive regulations over all types of private space activities. The Obama administration also requested authority to conduct space traffic management. The request does present an opportunity for Congress to streamline processes and enhance the strength of private sector space activities. For instance, stakeholders continue to raise concerns that they need certainty to attract investments and that they face pressing short-term launch dates and regulatory risk. We should address these issues and ensure that the executive branch does not stifle innovation. Going forward, it should be easier, not harder, for private sector companies to freely explore space. America faces a crisis of overregulation. Regulatory overreach has eroded far too many liberties. To the greatest extent possible, we should address public policy challenges without creating new regulations. It has been eight months since the Obama administration delivered their message of overly burdensome regulations to Congress, but the public debate has shifted in the last few weeks. Instead of presuming that expansive new agency regulatory powers are needed, the conversation is shifting to questions of how to minimize agency regulation or avoid it altogether. This is a good sign. It shows that the space community is doing the hard work necessary to develop good law and policy. This is no easy task, particularly when our goal is to empower private investments and discoveries, not impede them. Let us not forget that the Outer Space Treaty is a treaty of principles with great discretion granted to the United States on how to implement its obligations. In last Congress's enacted U.S. Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act, Congress made an interpretive declaration of the Outer Space Treaty term national appropriation, codifying the right of U.S. citizens to legally take possession of space resources. Congress should keep this power in mind as we address the future questions of treaty compliance. Government space programs explore the unknown, discover new worlds, and develop new science and technologies. But to unlock the great economic potential of outer space, we need to encourage the ingenuity, innovation, and interest of our private sector. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Yes, sir. Thank you. And now I recognize the ranking member of the full committee, the gentlewoman from Texas, uh, Ms. Johnson. Thank you very much, and welcome to our witnesses. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you holding this <laughs> hearing on regulating space. I'm really excited about the possibilities for the commercial exploration and utilization of outer space. The many proposals for new private sector space activities exemplify a nation's capacity for innovation. However, the pace of technology often moves faster than the policies that should guide uh, its development and use. And so we find ourselves at a key juncture at non-governmental actors and investors seek some policy clarity regarding their proposed activities in space. We have a responsibility to provide them with as clear guidance as possible. We also have a responsibility to uphold our international treaty obligations and ultimately be good stewards of outer space. Just the other day, I read in the Dallas Morning News, my hometown paper, an article titled, Orbiting Junkyard Begins to Threaten Space Economy. What will it mean, for example, to have constellations involving hundreds of miniature satellites orbiting the Earth? 
how do they affect the potential collisions in space and what impact would an increasing chance of collisions have on future U.S. government and commercial space activities? The legislative proposals put forth by the previous administration include a direction such as, I quote, the Secretary of Transportation in coordination with the Secretary of Defense is authorized to examine the planned and actual operational trajectories of space objects and to advise operators as appropriate to facilitate prevention of collisions. Quote finished. While this proposal is one of a number of potential approaches, it or another measure will be needed to ensure that space remains a productive environment for scientific investigation, commerce, and government activities. Mr. Chairman, I want our commercial space industry to grow and succeed, but determining what measures are needed to help ensure the safety and sustainability of space operations will require careful consideration. I hope today's hearing is just the beginning of a series of discussions to closely examine the full spectrum of issues regarding commercial space missions that do not fall under existing regulatory authorities. Our commercial sector, our nation's space program, and our future in space have much to gain from us taking time to get it right. I look forward to our witnesses' testimony. I thank you and yield back. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, now let me introduce our witnesses. We appreciate all of you being here. Uh, Mrs. Laura Montgomery is our first witness today, attorney and sole proprietor of Ground-Based Space Matters, LLC. Mrs. Montgomery spent over two decades with the Federal Aviation Administration, serving as the manager of the Space Law Branch in the FAA's office of the Chief Counsel. Ms. Montgomery received her undergraduate degree from the University of Virginia and her law degree from the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you for being here. And Dr. Eli Dorado, uh, our second witness today, Senior Research Fellow and Director from the Technology Policy Program at the Mercatus Center of George Mason University. Uh, Dr. Dorado is an advisor to the State Department on International Telecommunication Matters and has served on several U.S. delegations to the United Nations. He received his bachelor's degree in economics and political science from the Furman University and his Ph.D. in economics from George Mason University. Thank you for being here. Uh, Mr. Doug Lavero, welcome. Our third witness today, uh, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Space Policy. Uh, in, his, in this role, he led departmental activities in international space cooperation and assessment of the national security impacts of commercial space activities. Mr. Lavero worked for the Department of Defense for over 30 years, managing national policy for the full range of national security space activities. Mr. Lavero earned a bachelor's degree in chemistry from the United States Air Force Academy, a master's of science in physics from the University of New Mexico, a Master's of Science in Political Science from Auburn University, and a Master's of Business Administration from the University of West Florida. Welcome. Mr. Dennis Burnett, our fourth witness today, is Adjunct Professor of Law at the College of Law at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. Mr. Burnett also is Chief Counsel, Government and Regulatory Affairs at Cometa Corporation. Mr. Burnett has done extensive work with all aspects of commercial space activities, including preparing and obtaining one of the first NOAA-issued licenses for a U.S. commercial remote sensing satellite system. He has served three terms on the Defense Trade Advisory Group for the U.S. Department of State. He holds a bachelor's degree of science in political science, excuse me, and German from Nebraska Wesleyan University, a Juris Doctorate uh, from the University of Nebraska College of Law and a Master of Law from Georgetown University. So welcome. Dr. Henry Hoag, our fifth and final witness today, is a specialist in American national government at the Congressional Research Service, where he has conducted research in federal government organization and reorganization, the presidential appointments process, 
and the practices surrounding presidential recess appointments. Dr. Hogue earned his PhD in public uh, administration from the American University. So I now recognize Mrs. Montgomery for five minutes to present her testimony. Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Johnson, Chairman Babin, and Ranking Member Barra, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to participate today to address the role of Article VI of the Outer Space Treaty in the regulatory responsibilities of the United States. I respectfully recommend that the United States not regulate new commercial space activities, such as lunar habitats, mining, satellite servicing, or even lunar beer brewing, for the wrong reason, namely, the belief that Article VI makes the United States regulate either any particular activity or all activities of U.S. citizens in outer space. A misunderstanding of the Outer Space Treaty looms as a possible barrier to private space activity and investment because many claim Article VI prohibits commercial operations in outer space unless the government authorizes and supervises, which I'll refer to as regulates or oversees, those activities. Article VI states, the activities of non-governmental entities in outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, shall require authorization and continuing supervision by the appropriate state party to the treaty. To interpret this as forbidding unauthorized private space activity is wrong for three reasons. First, the treaty doesn't forbid private persons from operating in outer space. Second, it doesn't say that either all activities or any particular activity must be authorized. And finally, Article VI is not under U.S. law self-executing, which means that it does not create an obligation on the private sector unless and until Congress says it does. By its own terms, Article VI does not prohibit space operations by the commercial sector. First and most simply, it's not in the plain language of the provision. Instead, it leaves it to each country to decide which particular activities require regulation, how that regulation will be carried out, and with how much supervision. If Article VI truly meant that all activities had to be overseen, where would oversight stop? Life is full of activities, from brushing one's teeth to playing a musical instrument, which take place now without either federal supervision or continuing federal authorization. Just because those activities take place in outer space does not mean they should suddenly require oversight. Conversely, activities regulated on Earth might not require oversight in space. Accordingly, if Congress hasn't said that a certain activity requires oversight, it doesn't. Next. Article VI is not self-executing, which means it is not enforceable federal law until Congress passes a law to implement it. Just as the Supreme Court said in Medellin versus Texas, when the court did not let the president enforce a ruling of the International Court of Justice against the states because Congress had yet to act, Article VI's call for oversight requires, in the U.S. system, congressional action in the form of legislation. Accordingly, Regulatory agencies should not attempt to enforce this treaty provision by denying licenses or payload authorizations or by attempting to regulate that which they do not have jurisdiction over. What the government should not do is pass a law so broadly worded as to encompass all activities that could take place in outer space. Due process considerations of notice and transparency mandate that if Congress chooses to regulate a sp space activity, it should identify that activity. The Supreme Court, in criminal and First Amendment cases, has stated that laws should be drafted so that persons of ordinary intelligence can tell what is forbidden and what is required. And that would be a good model to follow here. Legislating that all space activities require federal oversight could entrap people engaged in perfectly benign activities. They might reasonably believe that something they do all the time on Earth wasn't a space activity or operation of a space object subject to regulation. What is forbidden or required should be clear, and the government must provide adequate notice of what has to be authorized. It would be unnecessarily burdensome and wasteful to regulate everything everyone does everywhere in outer space. <laughs> 
The most certain and long-lasting solution, and the one I advocate because it would reduce opportunities for confusion, misunderstanding, and regulatory overreach, would be for Congress to prohibit any regulatory agency from denying a U.S. entity the ability to operate in outer space solely on the basis of Article VI. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Montgomery. I now recognize Dr. Durato for five minutes to present your testimony. Chairman Babin, uh, Ranking Member Barra, members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me here today uh, to participate in this timely hearing on how to promote innovation in liberty and outer space while meeting our international obligations. My name is Eli Dorado, and I study the regulation of emerging technologies at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Space is a domain that, until now, has been dominated by governments. In that respect, it is similar to the state of the internet in the 1980s. Uh, commercial use of the internet was prohibited until 1989. Once commercial activity was allowed, the internet began to flourish and grow into the enormous economic and cultural force that it is today. Vint Cerf, one of the fathers of the internet, credits permissionless innovation for the economic benefits the internet has generated. As an open platform, the internet allows entrepreneurs to try new business models and offer new services without seeking the approval of regulators beforehand. Because of the First Amendment and some foresighted bipartisan policies put in place in the 1990s, there's little prior restraint on the business activities that may be tried online. When harms and failures occur, we address them in an ex post manner. My colleague Adam Thierer has generalized this notion of permissionless innovation in his book by that name. In any number of regulatory domains, there are serious legitimate concerns that make it tempting to require innovators to seek approval before they proceed. While regulatory approval can address those concern, concerns, it does so by dramatically slowing the pace of innovation. We must therefore build in some tolerance for mistakes, failures, and learning so that innovation can move forward. To a considerable extent, organic bottom-up solutions will do a better job of solving these complex social problems without unduly, unduly slowing the pace of innovation. Permissionless innovation can also be applied to space. Uh, Congress should seek to maximize the latitude the private sector has to experiment with commercial space endeavors. As with other domains, this freedom to experiment will result in some mistakes and failures. Yet over the long run, permissionless innovation will result in faster progress and more robust solutions to policy problems than a precautionary regulatory mentality. To be sure, space is a unique domain. Space is an extremely hostile and dangerous environment, and there are clear national security interests to consider. Nevertheless, Americans have already observed the benefits of a more permissive approach to space technology, not least in the modernization of the global positioning system. When the Clinton administration ended selective availability, giving civilian users access to the same level of granularity and GPS data as the military, numerous commentators decried the irresponsibility of the administration's decision to allow uncontrolled access to higher resolution location data on national security grounds. The predicted negative consequences never came to pass, and innovation flourished. Countless applications from mixed reality to ride sharing depend on the high quality data this liberalization produced. Today, almost no one advocates bringing back selective availability. Given the closely controlled nature of space technology, further liberalizations are in order and would similarly yield higher levels of innovation. Yet there is one recent proposed policy change that is headed in precisely the wrong direction. Uh, last year, the previous administration reported to Congress on a framework to regulate commercial activity in space. The administration proposed a framework in which explicit authorization from the Secretary of Transportation would be needed for every mission, which is defined as the operation of any space object. Uh, as Ms. Montgomery has testified, uh, this framework is unnecessary to meet our international treaty obligations. It is also exceedingly impractical and destructive. Uh, in the future that we are all working toward, humanity will establish permanent settlements in orbit and throughout the solar system. Achieving this goal will necessarily entail the operation of millions of space objects on each occasion triggering a need for authorization from the Secretary of Transportation back on Earth. This state of affairs is unworkable and will hinder our progress into the universe. The mission authorization framework represents the antithesis of the permissionless innovation my colleagues at the Mercatus Center and I believe is necessary for rapid technological development in space or in any other domain. Uh, 
Instead of adopting the Obama administration's proposal, I urge the Congress to consider blanket authorization for all non-governmental operations in space that do not cause tangible harm to other parties, whether foreign or domestic, in their peaceful exploration and use of outer space. Such an approach would meet our treaty obligations while maximizing the scope for innovation and experimentation in space. I thank the subcommittee for its interest in and attention to these issues, as well as for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Dr. Dorado. I now recognize Mr. Lavero for five minutes to present your testimony. Thank you, Chairman Babin, Ranking Member Bearer, and members of the subcommittee. I'm pleased to join Ms. Montgomery, Dr. Dorado, Mr. Burnett, and Dr. Hogue to talk to you today about the issues and questions surrounding the possible need to regulate the burgeoning U.S. commercial and entrepreneurial space industry. I come before you as the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Space Policy to provide you my view on the challenges of assuring continued U.S. leadership from primarily a national security perspective. But that perspective is informed by a sure understanding that strength in national security is inextricably tied to the health and vitality of U.S. industry and that without a vibrant, innovative, and bold commercial and entrepreneurial space sector, the U.S. risks falling behind peer competitors in the national security space realm. Given that by any measure, space is integral to modern war fighting, that's a risk we cannot allow to happen. So thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Let me quickly explain why this is so important. Today we find that space capabilities are fully intertwined into every aspect of U.S. war fighting from the largest major force conflict down to the smallest unit level action. But threats to those capabilities are growing and are evolving at an alarming rate, representing a huge range of possible attack modes, including every known form of kinetic, electronic, and cyber attack. As we in DOD analyzed this problem over the last four years, it became clearer to us that if we were to deter or defeat such attacks, we would not be able to do it solely from within the confines of U.S. military spending, nor by following the development timelines associated with U.S. military procurement. There was not enough money, and the threats were evolving too quickly. Luckily, we didn't have to. Worldwide commercial space activities today comprise nearly $280 billion enterprise, and the overwhelming majority of that is from within the United States. U.S. government space spending, on the other hand, is one-sixth that amount, about $45 billion. More importantly, commercial and entrepreneurial space activities more, move more quickly and are innovating in every aspect of the space enterprise, including mission types, manufacturing methods, terrestrial infrastructure, and orbital domains. So as we in DOD tried to figure out how we would defend U.S. national security space interests against the threats we saw developing, we realized that one of the primary pillars of that defense would be built on the success of the U.S. commercial space sector. In short, our conclusion became that the, US, the strength of the U.S. commercial entrepreneurial space sector was a key ingredient in DOD's strategy to deter aggression in space and to defeat those threats if it was ever used. So it was against this backdrop that in my role as the lead for defense space policy, I began to assess what steps DOD specifically and the U.S. government more generally needed to take to assure a vibrant, innovative, and bold commercial and entrepreneurial space sector would be there when we needed it. As I explain more fully in my written statement, in my mind, the, single sing the largest single threat to a thriving commercial space market we all seek to foster is the potential for lapses in space flight safety, which would seriously damage the entire commercial space industry. This is the key issue for us to understand. Whereas accidents in the terrestrial environment have impacts that are limited and quantifiable in economic, spatial, and temporal terms, accidents in space have an unlimited temporal and physical dimension and effects that go well beyond our ability to economically quantify their impact. How can we even begin to assess the cost to U.S. national security if an errant CubeSat accidentally destroyed a U.S. national technical means satellite? Would we just value the cost of that satellite, all the intelligence it may have collected over the rest of its expected life, all the cost to the commercial space market if, if um, we closed it down for an entire year or two investigating the causes and then solutions of such an accident. And that doesn't even begin to talk about the resulting debris that would be up there for centuries. Even worse, what if that CubeSat had been launched by a foreign power, an ally like Japan or an adversary like Russia? Would the collision be viewed as an attack? And if it were, the other way around, would Russia view a US satellite that hit one of theirs as an attack? It's not my purpose here today to answer these questions. Instead, my point is to say that a laissez-faire approach to spaceflight safety has serious and non-quantifiable impacts that extend well beyond the impact to the investor, 
the scientist or the high school that might own the cube set or the comm set. I am also not saying that the only way to avoid that potential future is to emplace a set of government regulations. There are many ways to skin this cat. But rest assured, we must take some action. The space environment is becoming crowded and the potential for accidents is increasing greatly. The surest way to harm this burgeoning industry is to not provide the mechanisms to assure spaceflight safety. And if we want to make sure those measures advantage rather than disadvantage U.S. industry, it is time for the U.S. to take the lead. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Lavero. Now I recognize Mr. Burnett for five minutes. Present your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I'm here to present my views about how to achieve freedom of space. To me, freedom of space is a goal to achieve maximum freedom of action balanced with restraints necessary to protect important national interests and restraints that are not arbitrary. Now, freedom of space for governmental activities was firmly established in the Outer Space Treaty, as you mentioned in your opening statements, Mr. Chairman. However, freedom for commercial uses of space was not a foregone conclusion as it was opposed by the Soviet Union. The compromise that was reached is contained in Article 6, and you have already heard what Article 6 provides. Now, that compromise was not a difficult compromise for the United States in 1967. There was one, only one commercial operator of satellites. That was the Communications Satellite Corporation, or ComSat. And ComSat was fully regulated by the Federal Communications Commission. Now, in 1984, uh, the FCC type of regulation was expanded to cover commercial remote sensing and commercial launch services. And it can be fairly said these comply with the requirements of Article 6. Well, now we are on the cusp of a new era of commercial activities in outer space. We are seeing new business ideas innovative technical developments, and the availability of funding to make these ideas possible. Imagine the, the innovations that will be enabled by the reduction of the cost of access to space by re reusable launch vehicles. Now, the advent of new space activities, that is, activities that are not regulated by the FCC, not regulated by NOAA, and not regulated by the FAA, the advent of these new activities presents us, the nation, with an opportunity to re-examine and rethink our national approach to regulation, and the opportunity to consider how to remove unnecessary barriers to realizing the benefits of new space activities. We are here today, or I am here today, to re-examine and rethink three such subjects. First, the treaty obligations. As you know, the treaty in Article 6 requires a minimum of some type of authorization and supervision. I think the word minimum, minimum here is extremely important. Authorization needs only to be some form of official permission or approval of an activity. Supervision needs only to include some type of monitoring on a recurring basis. The treaty does not require more. Second, the options. Congress can choose from options that range from regulatory heavy to regulatory light. You know, regulatory heavy are the existing regulatory models. Regulatory light could be something as simple as a registration model. Third, what are the restraints necessary to protect important national interests. Now, the existing, existing regulatory models provide, I believe, a cautionary lesson for trying to protect national security by requiring coordination and cooperation between numerous executive agencies and, be requ and by requiring compliance by the applicant with unspecified national interests. Some of the decision criteria that are used are black boxes. And classification of information is sometimes used or can be used as a shield to protect against untethered discretion. The applicant must prove a negative, which is a logical impossibility. 
and the bur burden of forward uh, never shifts from the applicant. Almost in any other circumstance, such a process would be considered to be both arbitrary and capricious and lacking the fundamental balance necessary to achieve what we consider to be the standards of freedom. Freedom is not president when restraints are arbitrary. Now, one possible solution is to establish by legislation a clear list of objective decision criteria and establish a threshold for shifting the burden of going forward. Now, some examples are provided in my written testimony. Now, the elephant in the room is classified information. However, I must say that only once in my nearly 40 years of private practice have I encountered a situation where a security requirement truly, truly precluded the resolution of a problem. So in conclusion, I would like to emphasize that it is in our national interest to re-examine and rethink our national approach to regulation. Our new generation of space entrepreneurs deserve freedom to innovate, new technologies, new products, and new ways of doing business. They deserve freedom from arbitrary restraints, and they deserve a process that can provide an authorization at the speed of business. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burnett. I now recognize Dr. Hogue for five minutes for your testimony. Chairman Babin, Ranking Member Barra, and other distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to testify on regulatory uh, organizational frameworks that currently exist in federal law. My brief oral statement will summarize my written statement, which I previously submitted. This discussion is intended to inform your consideration of potential approaches to regulating space. I will begin with a discussion of traditional frameworks in which regulatory power is delegated to federal agencies. I will then briefly discuss four regulatory models that involve quasi-governmental or non-governmental organizations. To begin with, I'll discuss traditional regulatory frameworks. The most prominent means by which the federal government compels conduct by private entities is through a congressional delegation of regulatory power to a federal agency. In many cases, the agency is empowered to issue rules that are consistent with this delegation that have the force and effect of law. Such rulemaking must, must follow statutory procedures that provide the opportunity for public input. In other instances, Congress has given a federal agency the authority to control private conduct through the provision of individual licenses. The licensee generally is required to comply with certain conditions in order to maintain the license. That summarizes the traditional regulatory regime. I now turn to four alternative regulatory models involving quasi-governmental or non-governmental entities. First, let me discuss government corporations. Government corporations are intended to perform a public purpose and are given corporate form to provide certain private sector-like flexibilities necessary to carry out that purpose. Each government corporation is either wholly or partially owned by the government. In some cases, government corporations engage in regulatory activities pertaining to the products or services they provide and the constituencies they serve. For example, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation is one such agency. Then I'd like to discuss non-governmental standard setting. Private st standard setting entities are voluntary organizations that develop technical specifications for various reasons, such as to ensure that products from different manufacturers are compatible with each other. In many cases, federal agencies then promulgate regulations in which these standards are incorporated by reference, thus giving them the force of law. The types of organizations that get involved in standard setting include, for example, testing laboratories, professional societies, and independent committees affiliated with trade associations. Congress has mandated that federal regulators incorporate privately st develop standards under certain circumstances. Sometimes mandate has been given to specific regulators, such as the Occupational ha Safety and Health Administration. More broadly, federal law generally requires that federal agencies use technical standards developed by such entities. This mandate is to be carried out by consulting with and sometimes working with these standards groups. The third regulatory model I'd like to discuss entails the establishment of federally chartered corporation with congressionally sanctioned exclusive jurisdiction over an activity in a specific quarter of American life. This kind of federally chartered organization is not considered to be part of the federal government. Congress has not vested such entities with specific statutory regulatory authority or mandates, 
Rather, the entity has been charged with operating in the given arena consistent with private arrangement, arrangements, existing statutes, and other legal authorities. One example of this kind of mechanism is the United States Olympic Committee. Established by law as a federal corporation, the USOC is empowered to exercise the exclusive jurisdiction over all matters pertaining to the participation of the United States in the Olympic Games and in the Pan American Games, and over the organization of these events when occurring in the United States. Finally, I'd like to briefly touch on the fourth model, self-regulatory organizations. These generally encompass private entities formed by members of an industry in an effort to self-regulate, either because traditional governmental regulation is impractical or because the industry hopes to deter governmental regulation by demonstrating that the industry can effectively supervise itself. In some cases, the SRO is purely private with no involvement from the federal government. For example, the International Association of Antarctica Tour Operators was formed by private operators to establish procedures and guidelines for travel to the Antarctic. Association members must comply with these. The association has been delegated no authority by the United States government. Other SROs are, far, are more significantly intertwined with the federal government. The Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, or FINRA, is one such uh, self-regulatory body for broker-dealers. FINRA was not created by federal law, but federal law does require individual broker-dealers to register with FINRA and comply with its rules. The Securities and Exchange Commission plays a significant role in supervising and overseeing FINRA's promulgation and enforcement of rules. This concludes my testimony. I would be happy to respond to questions at the appropriate time. Thank you, Dr. Hogue. Um, I want to thank all the witnesses for your testimony. We're looking forward to hearing your comments and your answers. Uh, the chair now recognizes himself for five minutes. Uh, first, uh, Mrs. Montgomery, uh, does authorization and supervision mean federal agency regulation? It usually does. As we heard from um, Congressional Research Service, it doesn't have to. I think that if we were to follow the, the uh, Mercatus uh, suggestion of a blanket authorization, that would sort of codify cur the current state of affairs, which is that if it's not forbidden for you to do something, you can go do it. But I think the question of continuing supervision gets a little trickier because someone does have to go look at somebody and what they're doing and inspect them or monitor them in, in some way. So I'm not sure the blanket authorization gets us all the way there. I understand. Uh, and one other uh, uh, for you, Ms. Montgomery. One concern I hear from stakeholders of non-traditional space activities is that they lack regulatory certainty. Uh, they fear that the government will inhibit some aspect of their operations. And wanting certainty and wanting regulation are two different things. How do you recommend that Congress or the executive branch put to rest uh, these questions and these uncertainties? Well, I think a lot of the uncertainty arises out of the mistaken view that Article VI prohibits private activities in space unless they are authorized. I've heard this from people in industry, from uh, private practitioners of the law, and it is, it is not correct. The treaty doesn't say that, and it is, it is not necessary that you get authorized. Um, one way of looking at it is that we have space tourism now. It is not subject to authorization or continuing supervision, and yet no one is concerned. Yet it is an activity. So everyone should rely on the fact that the treaty is not self-executing and get on with their business. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Dorado, in order to satisfy Article VI authorization, and supervision obligations, the Obama administration proposed the Department of Transportation have regulatory authority to ensure consistency with international obligations, foreign policy, and national security interests of the United States. This is an extremely broad uh, grant of authority. Uh, what is the risk of such a broad grant of authority? And how else could Congress or the executive branch address Article VI obligations? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think you're absolutely correct. This is a very uh, broad grant of authority, and the only way to meet all of those criteria would be for the Department of Transportation to consult widely within the interagency. Uh, that will introduce uh, a, a, a lot of friction 
Um, and I, I think that's the number one risk, that it's going to just slow down the process to such an extent that innovation cannot proceed. I think another very serious risk is uh, non-transparency. Uh, as Mr. Burnett testified, that some of these uh, rulings will be a black box. Uh, there's no time limit on, on getting a response in, in the Section uh, 108 report. Um, and then, so I think the, the broader risk is that uh, s companies that want to engage in space activities will go abroad. They will seek uh, flags of convenience, as, as they have done in, in maritime law, uh, and they will put investment in other countries instead of the United States uh, in order to establish a genuine link with those countries that, that, um, that off offer that service. So I, I think that... Um, I think that blanket authorization, uh, w as Ms. Montgomery said, would codify the current state of affairs. Uh, this committee would be uh, you know, well advised to hold periodic, perhaps annual hearings, uh, uh, reviewing the, spate, the state of commercial space as a part of its continuing supervision. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, one more. Uh, to my knowledge, no state has ever lodged a complaint that the United States is in violation of Article VI obligations. Uh, we've had a U.S. company successfully receive payload approval for lunar missions. What exactly is the Article VI problem that Congress is being asked to fix? And is this an issue that could easily be fixed by the Trump administration taking executive action? And I'm, I'm, I'm directing this to you, Ms. Montgomery. I am not personally familiar with how easy it is to prepare an executive order, but I do think the administration could direct the federal agencies under it to comply with the law regarding self-executing treaties and tell them not to deny a license or payload determination or attempt to regulate um, outside of their authority on the basis of existing Supreme Court case law on, on non-self-executing treaties. I One caveat is I'm not sure that the executive orders apply to independent agencies such as the FCC, so I see that as a possible um, the other thing is uh, each of these regulatory agencies could issue a legal policy statement quieting the concerns of industry that things will be stopped on the basis of Article 6. The 108 report itself is clearly based on this mistaken assumption that, that it is uh, that Article 6 stops private activity. And also, it is based on another mistaken assumption that all of the Outer Space Treaty applies to all private activities. In fact, it does not. Where, where the treaty wants to make sure that something applies to private actors, it calls them out by name. It refers to you know, the acts of their nationals or non-governmental entities. But it only does that in a couple places. So it is important to realize that the 108 report with mission authorization in it is based on two very flawed premises and it should not be adopted. Okay, thank you so much. I've uh, uh, expended my time and I'd like to recognize uh, Mr. Barra at this point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think one of the dangers, um, just kind of listening to, um, to the opening statements, is regulations are not inherently good or inherently bad, right? When done appropriately, they provide guidance and they provide some clarity. And, you know, I would imagine from the commercial sector, from the you really do want some of that guidance and clarity, not to the extent that you stifle that innovation, but you have an understanding of what the rules of the, the road are. And that really should be what our goal is, is providing that guidance, but at the same time anticipating the challenges um, that might occur. A, an example would be, you know, I think, Mr. Lavaro, you you brought up is what does happen, you know, who's liable if a commercial entity launches a, a CubeSat and it smashes into another state's, you know, let's say a Chinese satellite or vice versa into one of our satellites. What's the, the liability there? You know, if we give blanket authorization as the United States, are, are we held liable for, for that? Um, again, I, there's no inherent um, problem in trying to anticipate potential challenges and provide guidance and clarity. Um, you know, I do have some concerns, you know, when we talk about just blanket authorization, I think, Ms. Montgomery, you, you talked about if we were able to do that, well, then if you can do something, you can go do it. But again, I worry about if you go do that and something bad happens, you know, we, 
that's not good for the commercial sector because if an accident like that happens, that could stifle commercial innovation as well, especially if there's a, a big liability risk. I, I guess I, I'd, I'd ask um, Mr. Lavaro a, a question. If our goal is to try to get that r right guidance and anticipate the challenges without stifling the innovation, we ought to be able to do that. It, and you know, maybe you can give us some, some guidance here and then maybe Mr. Burnett also. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, let me uh, first say that um, uh, if, the, uh, if the purpose of this hearing is to figure out if um, um, the Outer Space Treaty mandates us to do some authorization, I think we're looking in the wrong spot. Um, I'm in full agreement with Ms. Montgomery and uh, Dr. Dorado that that shouldn't be the basis for why we go ahead and regulate. Uh, we need to regulate for the good of America and for the good of American business and for the good of American national security. And I use the word regulation, but I don't necessarily mean regulation in the, in the narrow sense, but more in the sense that Dr. Hogue has already introduced. Uh, we need to make sure that, the, that space is safe for commercial um, expansion, that safe is a, spa is a safe s place for the U.S. to go ahead and achieve economic superiority and to maintain national security. Uh, safety in space is unlike safety in any other domain. Uh, collisions at sea sink to the bottom of the sea. That doesn't happen in space. Uh, collision, uh, things in, in the air fall to earth. That doesn't happen in space. Uh, they are limited in time and they're limited in dimension. That does not happen in space. The pieces of the first collision that happened ever in space are going to be up there for the next thousand years. Uh, so we have to be very cognizant of the fact that there are some rules that need to be created in order to go ahead and protect U.S. space activity, whether national security activity or economic activity, and quite frankly, not just from our own commercial sector, but the commercial sectors of other nations that might have less control than we could have. And the last thing that I would like to see happen is for other nations to develop rules that we then become forced to follow. That is not good for our industry. We need to lead, we need to develop rules that are right for the U.S., and then we need to convince the rest of the world that those rules are the ones they should follow. That's what we did in aviation, in the FAA. We created the rules, and then everybody else followed. That's where we need to be, because there's too great of a risk to our commercial endeavors, and too great of a risk to our national security endeavors if we don't do that. Great. Mr. Burnett, if you want to just expand on that. Yes, I, I really agree with Mr. Lavero about that. I think there's some really good reasons for um, having some form of authorization and supervision. One of them is, you know, industry, when they go to, to their regulator, excuse me, when they go to their financers, when they go to their insurance brokers, those people want some form of government authorization that they can rely on. Um, internationally, we want to be able to hold other nations to the same standards that we apply. And furthermore, the foreign commerce that's going to be developed here is requires our industries, our new space industries, to engage in foreign trade with foreign nations. <coughs> if those nations have the impression that the United States is not living up to its obligations under the treaty, there could be serious trade problems. Yeah, I'm about out of time, um, or I am out of time, but I would hope that on this subcommittee we could start addressing some of those issues and find that right middle ground where, you know, we're not overburdensome, but we also provide some clarity to the commercial sector, which will allow the commercial sector to thrive, and, you know, let's write the rules as the United States. Thank you, Mr. Beer. Uh, the gentleman from uh, California, Mr. Rohrbacher. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I would like to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, organizing this hearing. This is a, at a level of discussion that we need to, to have before we actually move forward uh, with litigation or, or legislation, which brings litigation. Uh, let me note that uh, uh, Mr. Dorado, he said something right off the bat and made a comparison, which was I think very, uh, well, mind expanding for me anyway, that you're comparing the internet to what we're doing in outer space. So we're comparing the science that we've achieved for very, very tiny, small things. Uh, we're comparing that same science that just the expanse of the universe uh, 
which uh, they told me in astronomy that we were learning secrets up there that uh, that apply to the molecular structures here. It's it's, it's a fascinating uh, sort of insight in the way the world world works. Uh, I have noticed that uh, uh, over the years, as I have been trying to figure out how the world works, that government bureaucratic regulation is actually the most efficient method known to man for turning pure energy into solid waste. Uh, so uh, that's one truism that we have to deal with when we're looking at this. We don't want to regulate and, and protect us to the point that we're not able to do anything in space. And that is a, uh, I believe that had the internet uh, uh, been structured and we permitted to tax the internet right off the bat, we would have taxed it into oblivion and regulated into oblivion. Yet we do know that libel laws and uh, fraud laws are enforced even though they're over the internet. So there's a relationship there that we need to establish that's a practical relationship, but with understanding the concept that they've got something new, let's get the most out of it uh, and not but not throw away every aspect of regulation that we talk about because liabilities uh, like uh, libel and fraud are indeed part of our whole legal system. Um, I, uh, let me just note that uh, uh, Mr. Lavaro, you described um, how the scenario where a satellite or some object that we put into space or someone else actually destroyed somebody else's space asset. Uh, I think this is a real problem and it's called space debris. And I think there's a, uh, what we're discussing today, Mr. Chairman, is a treaty that was actually uh, brought about and negotiated and agreed upon at the height of the Cold War, at the very height of the Cold War, when I was in a place being shot at in 1967 by Russian bullets, all right? and. Uh, the bottom line is that if we can do that in 1967 to try to further space cooperation, we could do that today. And what we're talking about is not a need for necessarily more regulation, but maybe a methodology of how we can have more cooperation with people who are engaged in space activities. And if we could work with the Russians when they were the Soviet Union, we should certainly expand upon that today to handle exactly the same target that you're talking about, space debris, so that nothing that we are doing in space or legalizing our, our private sector to do in space will in some way inhibit other people and future generations to utilize space. And space debris is something I would suggest that, uh, Mr. Chairman, that this subcommittee focus on and see if we can come up with some cooperative effort internationally to deal with that very same issue. And now you've got 30 seconds to say, you're brilliant or you really don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so uh, maybe you'll start down here just with a comment. Any comment on whatever? I do think that the, uh, thank you. I do think the liability issue is an interesting one that you mentioned um, in, the, in the litigation context, but I don't think it legally mandates the United States to regulate everything. Right. Uh, I, Mr. Robrock, I, I, I totally um, agree with your uh, assessment that just because we don't have to regulate something in advance doesn't mean that there are no regulatory mechanisms ex post, and I think it's very important to keep that distinction. And that is the distinction uh, I have in mind when, when and my colleagues have in mind when we talk about permissionless innovation and, and, and the ability to do something without uh, ex ante approval doesn't mean that you can just get away with, with absolutely everything. Sir, our time's over, so I'll keep it short. You're brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you're invited back. <laughs> I'm not going to follow that. <laughs> okay.
All right, time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Rohrbacher. <laughs> um, now, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Beyer. Well, I want to begin, Mr. Chairman Babin, Ranking Member Barra. Thank you for doing this. This is fascinating, although I have to take issue with Mr. Levero encouraging <laughs> to Mr. Rohrbacher. Um, I, Dr. Dorado, I'm fascinated by this whole idea of permissionless innovation. And, and if I sort of think back through the history of innovation, whether it's uh, you know, Marconi or Bell or Edison or the Internet or on and on and on, most of that seems to have been permissionless. Um, although I do worry, number one, we have all this CRISPR-X genetic technology now, especially on germ cells, and worry about what permissionless innovation might do there. And then I think Dr. Mr. Levero, um, in his written and, and verbal testimony, spoke very clearly about the one issue that came to him as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense about the collision caused debris in space and that they, the, the one case, they had a 100% likelihood of a collision between a commercially expendable small satellite and a major U.S. national security asset. When we can see ahead of time that there are going to be real problems with space debris, as Mr. Rohrbacher said, isn't, doesn't that handcuff us, us a little bit on permissionless innovation? Don't we have to, can we, can we not recognize that not everything can be addressed after the damage has been done? Uh, thank you, Congressman. I, I agree with you that CRISPR is uh, a fascinating technology, and um, I think that uh, permissionless innovation is where we will end up with that because it is so hard to regulate. Um, it, it, it is uh, something now that, that can be done uh, in, in the garage by, by someone with, with minimal training, and it, I think it will have major, major benefits for the world and also some very serious challenges that even make me uh, uncomfortable. Um, but uh, I, I think that we will adapt, and, and it's that um, process of adapting after the fact that, that is critical to permissionless innovation in any domain, uh, from CRISPR to, to space. As long as we can recognize ahead of time that there may be places where we can see um, a, a challenge coming. M Mr. Levero. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm sorry for encouraging uh, Mr. Rohrbacher. I'll, uh, I'll try not to do that in the future. So, um, so, um, so I, uh, you know, I am. I'm very much um, want to be uh, where Dr. Dorado is to say that um, everything should be permissionless. But that's just not the way the world can work. Um, there are some, uh, there are some things that absolutely uh, need to go ahead and have rules drawn around them. Uh, we see this all the time. I was sharing with uh, Mr. Barra before. The testimony began about uh, what uh, the state of affairs of driving around uh, uh, San Francisco looked like in 1906 before there was any traffic laws, um, and it was uh, pandemonium. And that was fine when cars were only going five miles an hour, but if you really wanted to create cars that could go 60 miles an hour, you needed some set of rules to say which side of the road you needed to be on um, in order to go ahead and do that. Uh, we couldn't have gone 60 miles an hour <coughs> without a set of rules that said which side of the road to be on. The example that you stated um, clearly was a significant national security concern. We had a license in front of us under what I think is, and I agree with uh, Mr. Burnett, is an over, uh, an over strenuous uh, regime in remote sensing, but we had a license in front of us remote sensing under the current rules that had no problem with remote sensing, but clearly were go was going to go ahead and have an incredibly deleterious impact on a U.S. national security satellite without question. Um, I, quite frankly, in front of this committee, I say I will overstep my authority. Uh, and I went to work with the firm to ask them to adjust their orbit. And they did, because they're concerned American citizens as well. But if they had chosen not to do that, I would have lost that case in court, uh, and we would have had the potential that those satellites were lost. Somebody needs to be able to have that discussion. It doesn't necessarily need to be a bureaucrat from the Department of Defense. It doesn't necessarily need to be somebody in the Department of Transportation. But somebody needs to be able to just have the discussion of which side of the orbit are we flying on? And how do we go ahead and make sure that we're doing this to the benefit of all? Uh, and we want to have that happen before the accident occurs, because while we can legislate after, we can't clean up after. V very quickly, Dr. Dorado also talked about uh, relaxing the access to gr the granularity of GPS data. Now it's given rise to Uber, et cetera. Um, I talked to somebody recently, I think it was a geographer at University of Maryland, who said there's yet another level of granularity that is uh, 
that would open up many new industries. Uh, and I don't remember whether it was from five meters to one meter or three meters to two inches. Or, but do you have any comment on it from a defense perspective? Uh, certainly. Um, I was a, a huge advocate on the DOD side to go ahead and uh, loosen all restrictions on imaging. Um, the rest of the world is going to do it anyway. Uh, we might as well be in the lead. Um, uh, it made no sense. While it may, while there may have been some time in the past where it made sense, it made no sense. And quite frankly, at the very end of the last administration, I convinced the intelligence community of that very thing. Um, and so we uh, were hopefully on our way to do that. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Byer. <clears throat> uh, our next uh, questioner is uh, the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Bridenstine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to see if I could get consensus uh, with you, Mr. Burnett, and, and Ms. Montgomery, because I think there's maybe some uh, inconsistencies regarding the self-executing concept um, that Ms. Montgomery, I think, brought up, which is, um, which is, which is I think, uh, really important. You mentioned that we do have to provide authorization and continuing supervision, although it can be very minimum, which I think would be, of course, appropriate. Um, she mentioned that for these non-traditional space activities, habitats, rendezvous and proximity operations for uh, maybe uh, orbital servicing or uh, maneuvering satellite station keeping, she suggested that maybe we don't have to do anything under the Outer Space Treaty because it's not self-executing, that authorization and continuing supervision is sufficiently ambiguous that makes bodies like this have to act, and since we haven't acted, we don't have to, to regulate those, those programs. Is that correct? Uh, this is an extremely complicated subject. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, I've heard uh, discussions by legal scholars that that's total, they're totally confusing. But I think here what we're talking about and the difference between what Laura and I are, are talking about is I'm talking about the obligation under international law that the United States government has. So that might not be a treaty. It could just be... Uh, norms of behavior that have been established over time. It, it could be, but in this case, it is in the treaty in Article 6. That's an obligation of the United States. That is not an obligation on private actors. There is no U.S. law that says you have to comply with Article 6. But under Article 6, correct me if I'm wrong, we, are, we, we the U.S. government, does have responsibility for those private actors, which is seemingly self-executing because that is not ambiguous. Again, it's self-executing in the sense that it is a requirement on the U.S. government. It's not a requirement on a private entity. Okay. So, so uh, do you agree with Ms. Montgomery? Let's do that. <laughs> in part. Okay. <laughs> Did you want to address this, Ms. Montgomery? Uh, yes. I would um, suggest that we should consider whether it's even self-executing on the U.S. government because it speaks of future activities. Right. And the Supreme Court law that we see on that issue has us look at whether something has to take place in the future, even when it's directed at the government itself. And I heard you use the example of uh, tourism, yes. that, 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 we, that we've been doing that, and that's not, uh, there is no authorization continuing supervision. I would argue that there has never been a tourist that launched on a commercial rocket, but only government-owned and operated rockets, which puts it at a different level. Dennis Tito was a private person, but I, I like your point. But he was on a Soyuz rocket, correct? Yep, a Russian American. Soyuz rocket? An American on a Soyuz rocket, a private okay. American. Okay. But I do, I do like your point about the levels, because it goes to the question of whether something is important or scary enough to be regulated. And I think mining is a great example of that. Here on Earth, mining is dangerous. There's cave-ins, there's landslides, there's emissions, there's runoff, your neighbors get hurt. You know, bad things can happen from mining. But if you've got a robot mining an asteroid far away from everyone else, do you really need to supervise that or so, like so authorize it? When you talk about uh, a robot mining an asteroid far away, that's, that's uh, in my opinion, probably doesn't need any regulation. But when you talk about a robot servicing a satellite in low Earth orbit or even geostationary orbit, that robot, of course, is doing rendezvous and proximity operations. And, of course, we have threats all around the world, Russia, China, that would claim that that would be a threat to their sovereign assets in, in space. And, of course, then, as Doug Lavero has correctly identified, that gets the Department of Defense involved immediately along with the State Department. And according to your testimony, you suggested that the FAA can override the Department of Defense and the State Department for these non-traditional space activities because you said in your testimony that the FAA 
has the ability to make foreign policy apart from the State Department and could override them. Is that correct? I did say that, but one thing to keep in mind is that the FAA does not have authority on orbit, so it can only override it for launch and reentry where it has authority, not where it does. So who has the authority in orbit? On orbit for uh, rendezvous and proximity operations, right now, no one does, but that's okay under Article 6. Okay. I don't agree with um, my my colleagues that if you have an actual safety concern, so do you think? Let me you ask can you. can regulate, you but it's not because of Article 6. Would the State Department um, permit that launch to take place if the FAA authorized it, and there is a risk? Uh, again, it wouldn't be our risk, but it would be the Chinese or the Russians claiming that there's a risk to their sovereign assets. And of course, that starts the negotiating process. Would the FAA override that whole negotiating process? The, the, the important thing that I think we need to take away from this mm -hmm. is that we have to have a mechanism to initiate the interagency process that ultimately results in an authorization. And Mr. Chairman, I know I'm out of time. Um, if there's an opportunity to do a second round, I'd be very grateful. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bridenstein. Uh, now, uh, the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Perlmutter. Uh, thanks to Drs. Uh, Babin and Barra. Um, just a couple comments and then uh, some questions. So Mr. Bridenstine and I are often on the same page on this kind of stuff, and we're on the same page again. But I, I do want to respond to a couple partisan shots that were taken early on in statements. And, you know, Dr. Babin said, uh, couldn't something be easily done by, fixed by the Trump administration? I'm not sure anything can be done easily by the Trump administration because they're taking so much time worrying about Russia, which, Professor, is the elephant in the room, okay? So having said that, as a lawyer, you know you say freedom, but there is no freedom in chaos, and there has to be some organization here. And to you, Ms. Montgomery, you talked about brushing teeth, okay? I'm glad we're not regulating brushing teeth, but you do need regulations for safety at the intersection down the block so that you're not in a crash, and you have to have regulations as to property. So the title to my home. You know, we don't need the Wild West where somebody can come in and bump me out of my home and say, well, wait a second, there's no regulation to title. You don't own it because the Constitution of this country ensures property rights. And so when you're talking about the robot on some distant asteroid, you know, maybe we don't need OSHA rules as to that robot, but we do need rules as to the property because my clients always wanted to know that if they were going to invest something, that they were going to own it. So that's my rant for a second. And to you, Professor, I would just say I agreed with your sort of synopsis because Article 6 has two other sentences besides just the one that Ms. Montgomery read, which I, th I thought you did a very nice job trying to interpret that sentence, but as a lot of judges would have said to me, nice try, that you don't quite get there. There is some level between the Wild West and the police state where we need some level of, of uh, regulation. And we do have that responsibility under Article 6. And so, Professor, you talked about a light touch or a heavy touch, or regulatory heavy and regulatory light. I mean, where do you really think we should be? Because we don't want to stop innovation here, but we also need to be able to protect property rights and safety and defense. So, uh, the floor is yours, sir. Well, I I actually prefer the regulatory light approach, but I, I agree with you, there are certain things that we need to protect, and I think we can do that. I think we could have a, for example, have a registration kind of authorization where the, the uh, actor, or the proposed actor in space would uh, register their activity, and, and I think you can define what that activity is. It's operation of a space object, or it's the building of a facility on the moon. I mean, those are, quite clearly covered by the treaty. Um, define those and say, okay, as soon as you register, you're authorized. And then you could provide the authority for the president or whoever you, you give the authority to to step in 
under certain circumstances and revoke that authorization if certain criteria are met. But those criteria have to be clear. They can't be ambiguous and they can't be arbitrary. Okay. Um, Ms. Montgomery, I mean, how, as a lawyer, would you go about protecting your client's property rights after they've spent $100 million to get to Asteroid X to start mining? And let's say the Russians say, wait a second, that's ours. What are you going to do? Good. Thank you. <laughs> because the, uh, the treaty does have a rather scary provision in Article 2 in which it pro forbids national appropriation of objects in outer space. Fortunately, to some extent, that was cured by the Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act of 2015. But there are a lot of legal scholars out there who claim that it forbids private property. I do not agree with them. And I completely agree with your, your perception that there is a need for um, agreements and rules of the road, usually from governments in property right areas, so that people can have titles, so that they can get collateral, so that they can have certainty and plan for the future. And I do think that there are legal theories that would support private property in outer space um, even further than was taken in 2015 by this Congress. So in that respect, I'm in agreement. On the Article 6, if I could, the um, the point I'm making is a narrow legal one. We might see a need to regulate something, but it should be the normal approach that Congress takes to whether there's a need to regulate something on the ground. Is there someone at risk? Is there a safety problem? Not, not just because Article 6 says we have to regulate everything. It doesn't, and we shouldn't. No, and I agree with that, but I think mm -hmm. given safety and property, there's got to be some role and I think that that article does require that role, and that's kind of why I was agreeing with that light touch versus heavy touch, and I yield back to the chair. Okay, thank you. And uh, I must add that I didn't think I was firing a partisan shot when I said that uh, I was looking forward to working with this, uh, this, this, admin this new administration when they develop a, a, a formal position on space. It wasn't you, it was Chairman Smith when he said an Obama administration. All right. Okay. All right. Let's see. Um, the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Biggs. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to each of the panelists for, for being here. This has been very interesting. Um, Dr. Dorado, it, you talked about um, the development of the Internet and permissionless innovation, and, uh, and you basically talked about ex post uh, manner of, of remedies for um, any, any basically liability or damage that might have occurred in the development of the internet. How do you see that working in space? Tell me, tell me about that. Is, it, is an ex post uh, remedy always the best remedy? Uh, well, Congressman, uh, thank you for the question. I, I think it needs to be combined with many other, uh, many other steps. So first, I would say that uh, I would like the uh, U.S. government to provide as many informational resources as possible to private actors in space in order to prevent accidents in the first place. So there already is an active involvement um, between collaborations between um, uh, satellite operators to, to pool data on uh, or, uh, space situational awareness and to the extent that the United States is willing to supplement that information or provide um, information about best practices and so on so in order to prevent uh, harms in the first place, I think that that would be welcome. I think second is would be welcoming uh, and, and expecting the uh, self-determination and, and self-regulation is, is being already uh, occurring in, in space. Uh, third, I think uh, courts are uh, a very general, uh, a very uh, general fallback mechanism for, for when uh, prevention is is inadequate. Um, we, we apply uh, court decisions to so many other aspects of our lives. Is space uh, space is, is surely a unique domain, but is it really so special that courts are not competent to, uh, to address the, the harms that arise there? Uh, and I would submit that uh, perhaps not. Perhaps courts can uh, play a useful role in, in, the, uh, in ensuring that space uh, is as safe as possible. Yeah, and, and Dr. Dorado, um, courts don't always um, act po ex post the, the issue. 
as we we heard uh, earlier, Mr. Lavero talking about the incident. It was it was taken care of outside the court. It was cooperative uh, and collaborative in nature. But um, there are remedies um, ex ante um, potential incidents as well. So um, I assume that uh, we would all agree that. Uh, we don't like necessarily like litigation, having been a trial lawyer myself, but uh, actually I liked it. But, um, <laughs> but, but it isn't always necessary to, to uh, partake in that. So uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you, Dr. Dorado, is you, and I'm going to quote from your, your, uh, your uh, statement. I urge the Congress to consider blanket authorization for all non-governmental operations in space that do not cause tangible harm to other parties, foreign or domestic, in their peaceful exploration, uh, and use of outer space. I am interested in the term you used, tangible harm, and I wanted you to expand on that, please. Um, sure. Uh, the reason I use that term is that the art Article 6 refers to potential harm, and I think that uh, that is a very uh, expansive term uh, and could be used to prohibit uh, absolutely anything. Uh, anything in space is potentially harmful. Um, and, and what article, what the Outer Space Treaty would require uh, would be for the United States to uh, consult as appropriate where we cause potential harm to the activities of other state parties. Uh, and so simply deeming it not appropriate to consult every time there's potential harm but not tangible harm uh, is, is uh, within, the, within the scope of Congress's authority. Thank you. And, and Mr. Lavero, um, I quote, I'm going to quote you now. You said, uh, there are many ways to skin this cat. And so I'd like you to, if, if you would, explain your preferred policy recommendation to this committee. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I, uh, I think um, I, I'm in uh, very uh, strong agreement with, uh, with Mr. Burnett and, uh, and some of the things that uh, Dr. Hogue has, has said here. Uh, I, I do believe that we need some very basic um, safety regulation uh, that would ensure that we don't have unmitigated collisions in space. Uh, and that, uh, as a former private pilot, um, if I was flying by visual flight rules, I knew there were certain altitudes I could fly at and certain altitudes I couldn't fly at. If you're an unguided small sat, then you should stay below the orbit of the space station, because otherwise you have the potential to hit it. Um, and that should be a simple rule that doesn't require regulatory oversight, it's simply a rule that everybody knows you can follow. Is it, so, are, you, are you suggesting something akin to a filing a flight plan? Uh, uh, not so much a flight plan, but a, 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 the knowledge that a, that a rule exists, certainty, certainty of what rules exist and what rules do not exist, uh, rules that you have to follow, uh, and that allows then the mission, auth the authorization registration that uh, Mr. Burnett talked about to occur, because you now will register within accordance of those rules. This doesn't require a government entity now to go ahead and give permission. It simply provides a set of rules that exist to ensure safe space flight. So, so you'd be saying that by filing something, registration basically, that meets the authorization requirement of of, of Section 6. Uh, right. Well, as I said earlier, I'm not a lawyer, and I, and I don't actually believe that what drives us should be Section 6. I think okay. what drives us should be what's good for America. Thank so. you. Thanks, Mr. Yes. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Um, it's been requested, and I think we will grant uh, an extra two minutes uh, for questions on uh, for whoever, whatever membership would like to, like to do so. And so, uh, Mr. Barron, I'd like to call on you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, oh, okay. Hold on. Hold on. Let me let me back up because <laughs> I forgot I had. Yeah, I'd like to rec recognize myself first. I apologize, as the chairman. Uh, sometimes I forget my leadership position here. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Burnett, uh, in the Outer Space Treaty and the Liability Convention, the United States agreed to be liable as a launching state. This raises concerns about whether the United States should impose more regulation on the private sector in order to protect against liability. How could, this bilateral, how could bilateral agreements and reciprocity mechanisms be used to mitigate against liability for the United States as a launching state? Well, I'm, I'm not sure that the activities we're talking about here really raise any serious issues of liability. Now, they might in future, but 
If you look at what we've done uh, with uh, our responsibility for liability in the launch area, we have a requirement for insurance, but that requirement doesn't extend to satellites that are communication satellites. It doesn't extend to remote sensing satellites because the risk of some liability really occurs on the launch. It doesn't really occur in space because on the launch, you've got a potential of absolute liability. But once you're in space, you're in the fault regime. And when you're in a fault <coughs> regime, you have to prove uh, that there's been negligence or something like negligence. And the, and the liability is a national liability. And so the issue of the liability of one nation to another nation, it's not from one nation to a private party, becomes a political issue. Right. So there are other ways to solve it other than requiring insurance or posting a bond or something like that. Okay, thank you. And just one more. Ms. Montgomery, is the United States liable for all private sector activities under the, the uh, Outer Space Treaty? I do not believe that is the case. Under both the Outer Space Treaty and the Liability Convention, we see that a uh, country is liable if it is a launching state. And there are only four ways to be a launching state. It's going from your territory, your facilities, um, your procure the government is procuring the launch. And then there's um, liability for private actors, which take place off the ground. And as Dennis said, that's, that's fault-based. But so there's, there's limits on what activities the United States would be liable for. And it's not for everything. OK, thank you. Now I'd like to call on the gentleman from uh, uh, California, Mr. Barrow. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A quick question, Mr. Labarro. Uh, several stakeholders have cited um, the interagency review process for commercial remote sensing um, licensing as a process that's led to undue delays, stifled innovation, economic capabilities, and commercial operations. And one of the reasons why we shouldn't, the interagency review should not be part any part of this mission um, authorization approach. Is this sort of a valid concern? If so, why? And if not, why not? So, sir, I, um, I, will, I will tell you that I think it is a valid concern that um, that, that licensing regime has stalled innovation. Um, and quite frankly, again, to, it goes back to what Mr. Burnett said, the black box that it w went in was undefined and people within government, um, we're all right-minded, mind you, um, defined it as they would. Uh, and, uh, and I personally um, uh, worked against that um, in order to go ahead and make that free, to try to go ahead and truly get down to the concerns that Congress had expressed in the statute, which is show me that there's a true national security harm, and then we should go ahead and regulate or prohibit, but otherwise don't, uh, don't regulate or prohibit. Uh, I think this is the same, uh, the same problem we're dealing with here. Interagency review is important. The interagency has a different perspective. But that inter interagency review needs to be bounded. Um, it, we can't just tell the interagency, you have authority to do this, and leave it up to them to decide on what basis they will make those decisions, because we bureaucrats tend to go ahead and accumulate power that we were never intended to have. Um, so I think we need to be clear. Your concern is a safety concern. Make sure there's no collision. Your concern is this kind of concern. Let's be very clear about what what we're giving them authority to do, and then allow that interagency process to do that within those limited bounds. So. Thank you, Mr. Barron. Now I'd like to call on the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Bridenstine. Mr. Chairman, I have a letter here from Dr. Mark Sandall I'd like to enter into the record. He's a professor at the Cleveland Marshall College of Law. OK. Um, I wanted to, uh, to, to bring to the attention of the panel here, and I, I know there's um, agreement and disagreement maybe about how uh, Article 6 should be applied. Um, Dr. Um, Sandall uh, disagrees with the, with the panel. I, I like your position better, Ms. Montgomery, quite frankly, but one of the things he says is, however, the need to adopt a bill, he's talking about um, some kind of bill for you know, starting an interagency review process, is equally driven by industry demand for regulatory clarity. And I would say not just regulatory clarity, but certainty and permanence. So from one administration to the next, there's not this ambiguity. Um, and uh, your testimony, Ms. Montgomery, clearly indicated the same thing when you say, however, since the issue of what Article 6 means has created legal and regulatory uncertainty, Congress could lay that uncertainty to rest with a directive to regulatory agencies to abstain from using the lack of federal oversight of a particular activity 
as a reason to deny a payload review. So we're talking about a directive um, to regulatory agencies to abstain from denying a payload review, a launch or reentry license or authorization for satellite transmissions or remote sensing. Mr. Chairman, I fully agree with this, and if we can get that kind of certainty that creates the agencies from abstaining from those kind of activities on these non-traditional space activities, I fully support it. Um, one of the challenges that, that is there, uh, Ms. Montgomery, you say there are clear advantages to this path. It would, of course, create certainty, which would be good. We want that certainty, which is helpful to industry's quest for innovation and investment. So there is currently uncertainty. I think everybody agrees with that. Uh, that uncertainty is creating a, a challenge to innovation and, of course, capital investment, of course, which is what Ms. Montgomery said here. The question is this. If we can't pass this bill that, that makes these agencies abstain from denying these activities, what do we do then? At that point, do we just accept the limitations on innovation? Do we just accept the fact that it's going to preclude capital formation? That's my question, Ms. Montgomery. No. <laughs> we don't accept it. We don't accept it. So we'd have another approach. Yes. The, the fact of the matter is that my recommendation is basically codification of the existing state of the law. We go look at the Supreme Court opinions and we apply them correctly and properly and knowingly and say, look, we can't stop you from going because we don't have a, a self-executing treaty here. Hooray. So, Mr. Lavero, what would the State Department of the DOD have to say about that? Uh, so, sir, I think uh, we would be concerned about that kind of approach. Um, uh, I, while I am absolutely 100% uh, in favor of uh, innovation and experimentation in space, there are, uh, there are implications that transcend our Article VI treaty obligations in fa and rather uh, go ahead and, uh, and move into uh, things like the United Nations Treaty uh, and the need to uh, go ahead and practice secure defense, um, to the need to avoid harm to other nations' uh, property. Uh, we have, we have um, requirements uh, throughout our landscape that assure that actions the United States take doesn't harm other nations. And in this case, actions we take in the commercial world doesn't harm other commercial operators. Uh, I think, I again, I am very much in, of the mind that we need to do as little regulation in this realm as possible, but we do need to assure that our actions don't harm our own companies, our own national security, or interests of other nations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. You're welcome. <clears throat> and now, uh, Mr. Byer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think it is pretty cool that we have two doctors leading this committee uh, on the Science Committee. It's, it's, it's a good thing. Um, it seems to me that the whole idea of this hearing was trying to figure out how we respond to the spirit and the letter of Article 6. You know, light regulation, heavy regulation, permissive innovation, all that. I was fascinated by something in Mr. Burnett's testimony. And this goes back to 1967, and, and let, me, let me quote. Ambassador Goldberg used the term self-executing to apply to provisions of the treaty that are to be understood to be subject to no further conditions and no further refinements, refinements such as Articles 4 and six, or four and 5. Ambassador Goldberg distinguished these provisions, Article 4 and 5, with other provisions of the treaty that are understood to be understood as statements of general principles, principles that state a worthy purpose that need further study, exploration, and elaboration to develop the rules to govern the use of outer space. Following this line of reasoning, only the treaty provisions that were understood not to be subject to further re refinements should be considered as provisions that are required conditions of the authorizations required by the treaty. If I read all this, does that mean that Article 6 is not moot, irrelevant, and we didn't need this hearing at all? Uh, in my interpretation, the answer to that is no. Article 6 is one of those provisions that we've agreed is going to apply immediately, just like the... the um, uh, the obligation not to, to uh, put in orbit nuclear weapons, not to put military facilities on the moon or other celestial bodies. I think Article 4 falls into that category. I think there are other provisions in the treaty that clearly were identified by Ambassador Goldberg to be things which we were going to study. And we hadn't really reached uh, a consensus on how to go forward on those. And that would be Article 6? No, that would not be Article not, 6. Not Article 6. Okay. Correct. All right, great. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Yes, sir. Thank you. Now I'd go to a 
Mr. Biggs, uh, two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I, I feel bad for Dr. Hogue because uh, you've been, I want you to know your testimony was not ignored, so I have a question for you, sir. And I, I, I saved it up for my last effort. Um, you talked specifically about um, non-governmental uh, organizations that regulate certain conduct and activities, such as the Antarctic Trade, International Ar Antarctic Trade Associ Organization and FINRA. And my, my question for you is, uh, do we know how successful, can you describe whether those have been successful achieving um, their organizational ends? I don't have a good answer for you on that, but I'd be happy to go back and, and provide that after hearing. Well, thank you. You've set me up to move right over to uh, the rest of the panel, um, which is, is there any organized um, cooperative or collaborative effort um, to, to address some of the issues we've been talking about today internationally that you're aware of? And if so, can you please uh, describe those briefly? And I guess we'll just start with uh, several of you are nodding your heads. Uh, Ms. Montgomery first, please. Yes, the UN addresses a lot of the debris issues and has issued guidelines on them. There is also an industry association, the um, data association, that coordinates amongst themselves as to, so as to make sure they don't bump into each other and cause debris. Dr. Dorado, in our previous uh, interchange uh, exchange, you, you mentioned, uh, uh, essentially I'll say transparency from government organizations as to where their space debris or space activities are. Can you elaborate on that, please? Uh, certainly. Uh, the Department of Defense uh, currently has much higher resolution data on space situational awareness than does the Space Data Association uh, that Ms. Montgomery uh, referenced. And, and um, I think it would be useful for the U.S. government to share uh, some of that data uh, with, with the private sector in order to improve their capabilities. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'd ask that the witnesses be allowed to answer the questions. Thank you. Mr. Lovero. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, as uh, Ms. Montgomery said, there are several um, uh, activities under sponsorship of the UN. One of them that uh, my office was heavily involved in was, is called COPURIS, the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, um, that we're trying to go ahead and, and look at what kind of rules would we need to use internationally to guide our use of space. Uh, I found it, uh, quite frankly, uh, very unfortunate that the U.S. had not established its own rules first that we could then take to COPUS and convince others to use. We had done this in the debris guidelines uh, that, uh, that were mentioned earlier. Um, NASA developed a set of standards, guidelines, on uh, orbital debris that we then took as a nation to COPUS and convinced the rest of the world they should follow. That's good for the U.S. We should do it again here. Um, we, should, we should have a position in COPUS other than to say we have no position, because that leaves the floor open for others to go ahead and insert their position. And Mr. Burnett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Thank you. And now I'd like to call on the uh, gentleman from Florida if you have a couple, a couple of some questions for two minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Montgomery, uh, in the outer space treaty, is the United States liable for all activities, private activities? Uh, no, sir, it is not. Um, it has to be a launching state or it has to be internationally responsible for um, damage on orbit. So there are, there are limitations to that. You have to be the, the uh, territory or facility from where an, a, an object is launched or you have to be procuring it. And um, if those criteria are not satisfied, then the U.S. is not a launching state and not liable. Do you have any concerns about that? I think that um, if the United States is not liable, then the private actor will be liable. So the, whoever is damaged will be made whole by bringing a suit against the actual causer of the damage, just like in the rest of life. Would there be a need for a statutory uh, provision in order to accomplish that? No, sir. Thank you. You'll back. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank the witnesses for their very valuable testimony and the uh, members for their questions. It's been very informative. Uh, and the record will remain open for two weeks for additional comments and written questions from members. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>